we've got a great message. If, if you haven't heard it before or you are just kind of dancing around with religion or maybe just checking religion out a little bit, we've got a great message here. And it's not just because it's our message. We believe it's a biblical message that God loved you so much that he didn't want you to go to hell. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of times people get excited about telling people they're going to hell. We don't get excited about that here. We get excited to tell people there's a solution so you don't have to go. And it's, and it's a free gift because Jesus paid it in full. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. You know, one of the great things about uh, this, uh, this Sunday is, is it's an opportunity to really focus on the resurrection. Like I said, we try to do that every week because it's so significant to our daily life. It's not just something that happened that was really cool 2,000 years ago, but it's significant to our daily life. You know, many of you know uh, that I just got back from a trip to Liberia, and, and I do some travel from time to time. And those that have traveled, you know, I mean, you end up sitting by different people uh, on airplanes. And, and, and in today's day, most people have their earbuds in, so you never even get to talk to them anymore. But it used to be in the old days... Um, that uh, you would talk to people. Now, you could still talk to people, but sometimes it's interesting. You'll sit by a, a, a businessman. You'll sit by a CEO. I, I remember on a, on a flight, uh, it was a kind of, I was on one of those, they call them the puddle jumpers. You know, they're really small. You kind of worry, like, if you lean too much, you, you might tip the plane yourself, so you're, you're real careful. But I was on a puddle jumper one time, and I sat next to a guy who was part of Ronald Reagan's White House uh, staff. And I was like, that is amazing. And, and then I've sat by homeschool moms, and I've sat by business executives, and I've sat by farmhands. And I, I mean, just you know how it is as you travel. You sit by lots of different people. You strike up conversations, and you learn a lot of interesting things. But oftentimes, just because I'm interested in spiritual things, I'm interested in talking to people about spiritual things, I'll, I'll try to shift the conversation towards spiritual things, or I'll look for opportunities to do that. And it's interesting because you'll start to talk to people and you'll say, hey, do you, what do you think happens after you die? And they'll say, well, you either go to heaven or hell. That's a pretty, almost a pretty universally held opinion, regardless of who you're talking to. And I'll say, well, what's your chances of getting there? And um, oftentimes they'll say, I don't know. I hope I'll get there. You know, like, I hope I'll get there. And I'll say, well, what does God require someone to get there? And, and what's really interesting, and I, and I can't list all of them, but these are some of the th- most common things that people say. You, you've got to go to church. You've got to be baptized. You've got to repent of all your sins. You've got to keep the commandments. You've got to be kind to others. You've got to give money. You've got to follow the teachings of Jesus. You've got to follow the teachings of Muhammad, Muhammad or Buddha. And, you know, just depending on who you're sitting by, these are the kind of some of the similar answers. Now, what's really interesting about this list is although it, it looks like it's all different, it looks like there's all these different steps, they're all basically saying the same thing. They're basically requiring your effort in some form or fashion to be good enough to satisfy whatever God's standard is. And usually when I get to the end of their list, whatever list they give me, I'll say something to the fact, well, what happens if you stop following Jesus? What happens if you break his commandments? Even after you wanted to, well, and, and, and honestly, a lot of them are very honest. They, they understand the logical progression of the question. They say, I'll go to hell. Because they understand that they're no longer good enough. That's kind of the mindset of here. And so I'll ask them oftentimes when they have this uncertainty, I'll just ask them the question, how good is good enough? Like, how good actually do you have to be? Do you just want to, do you just need to try to be good? Do you just need to want to be good? Is it some kind of a heart issue? Or is it actual an execution of goodness that you have to do. And oftentimes this leaves them stumped. They're like, man, I don't, <laughs> that's a great question. I don't know. Leaves them with a little uncertainty. And so this morning, I actually want to attempt to answer that question from the Bible. I want to look at what the Bible says about how good is good enough. How good do you have to be to go to heaven? And so the title of the message this morning is short sighted. And you'll see there's kind of a a double aspect of this title, if you will. So um, if you're, you're, you're in your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 19. We'll be in verse 1. The subtitle of the message is, Why Being Good Is Not Good Enough. Um, and this is, this is the short-sightedness of religion. Religion actually thinks you can, be, you can perform at a certain level to become good enough or to obtain a good enough standing with God, and religion is, is bankrupt. Religion is, you know, as I've said before, owns oceanfront property in Arizona, so it's not, it's not really going anywhere. 
But in Luke chapter 19, if you're familiar with the story, Zacchaeus, don't anybody sing the song? We know that song from uh, Sunday school, but Zacchaeus is a short little man, right? A wee little man, as the song goes. And so in Luke 19, 1, we get introduced, in Luke 19, 2, we get introduced to Zacchaeus. We read this, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Now, we learn a lot about Zacchaeus just in these first two verses, and, and some of it is we, we learn from culture. We've got to kind of go back to historical context and learn a little bit about Zacchaeus, but the first thing we learn about him is that Zacchaeus, the word, his name itself means the righteous one, which if someone in that day would have heard Zacchaeus and realized what he did for a living, they would have been like, that's super ironic. Like, that's, that's funny, because he was anything but righteous. It'd be like in our day, if we if, if a politician, you, you, you flip on C-SPAN and you see a politician on TV and his name is Integrity, you'd be like, that's a little funny. Like, that's a little ironic that this politician is named Integrity. It's kind of the same with Zacchaeus. He was not a righteous man. And the way that we learn that is that he was a chief tax collector and that he was rich. And this actually, these two descriptions tells us a lot about Zacchaeus. And one of the things we need to understand about tax collectors uh, at this point in history is they, they were hated by their fellow Jew. They were Jews who became traitors to their own people. And they were collecting money for the Roman government. And typically they were known for extorting money from their fellow Jews. And you see, the Roman government would say, this is what I want collected on taxes. When people come through, anything extra you can get, you get to keep. So when we find out that Zacchaeus is rich, what does that tell us? The dude's a good extortioner. Like he, he knows how to put the clamp down on his fellow Jews. And so we learn this. They, they tell us historically that, that as people pass by, and, and, and we're going to learn a little bit more about where Zacchaeus was stationed, but it's People pass by tax collectors' booths, that they would, they would force people to open up packages. It'd be like, you know, going through the TSA line. It's, it's bad enough you got to take your shoes off. It's bad enough you got to whatever. I mean, it, I feel bad for people that have, you know, uh, replacements in their body, and they set off every alarm in, uh, you know, under tarnation. But you're taking your shoes off. But imagine if you, every time you had to open your bag, and somebody just rifled through your belonging and set it all on a table and said, all right, you're going to have to give me $5 for that. You're going to give me $1 for that. You're going to have to me 10. I'm not giving you 10 for that. Okay, well, let's stay in here, you know? And this is kind of what tax collectors would do. And then guess what? When you were on your way back out of the city, same process. Open up your bag. I already paid tax on it. Yeah, you're paying it again if you want to keep it. And so Zacchaeus was on par in the culture with a prostitute. The people viewed tax collectors on par with the sinners of the prostitutes, with the drunks, with the murderers. Tax collectors were right up there with all these people. And so this tells us a lot about Zacchaeus. Not only that, but notice that the text tells us he was a chief tax collector. It means he was high level. He was really good uh, at what he did. And we're going to see in verse 7, people didn't like him very much. People did not like Zacchaeus. Interesting uh, other thing in, in verse uh, 1 is we learn that something else at Jericho. Jesus, uh, Jesus was entering and passing through Jericho. This was Zacchaeus' station. One of the things we see about Jericho, is it was a premier spot for a tax collector. Pretty much anyone who came from the east would pass through Jericho, and so it was a prime piece of real estate to be a tax collector. It'd be, you know, it, locally, it'd be equivalent if you were a tax collector on Highway 34 as it changes into Highway 54 going into Peachtree City. You'd be like, oh, man, I got a good spot. I'm going to make a lot of money here. This is how Zacchaeus was set up. And so Jesus comes to town. We learn uh, in verses three through four, Zacchaeus wants to see him. And so let's read that. It says, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. He was of short stature. So he ran ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And so we see that Zacchaeus was really interested in seeing him. This is not unique. Jesus' popularity was off the charts at this time in his ministry. And so Zacchaeus hears about Jesus. Crowds are gathering. He goes to see him. And, and the guy, poor guy, man, he's just short. He's stuck behind the crowd. No one likes him, so they're probably boxing him out too. You know, I mean, it's like they're probably pulling that basketball drill uh, where they're boxing him out, not letting him up to the front. And so Zacchaeus kind of looks and, and kind of tries to project where Jesus is walking. He's, and he runs ahead and he hops up 
in a tree just to be able to see him. And so obviously Zacchaeus was uh, short, so he wasn't going to be able to see Jesus. And he does two things here in this text that a man of his stature did not typically do. Um, Rich men in this culture didn't run. In fact, rich men in our culture don't often run. You know, they, uh, I've, got a, I've got a buddy that was a former Secret Service agent. And, and, and if you remember, um, President Bill Clinton used to like to run. You know, that was kind of the big joke on Saturday Night Live. He would run to a McDonald's and eat a Big Mac, and then he would, he would run. I mean, it's like, but he did like to run. And oftentimes he would get up early, uh, my friend said, and he would run, um, you know, just out in the streets of Washington. And so Secret Service agents would have to run with him and protect him. And, and um, one time... They were, they were crossing a street early in the morning, and they told President Clinton, no, just, just wait, you know, because this, this bus is coming. And President Clinton's like, no, nah, I can beat it, you know, or what have you. So, and I don't know if you've ever been in a big city, but sometimes, like, when you, when you go across the street, sometimes, like, cars are trying to teach you a lesson, and they'll, like, rev up and, like, come close. Well, anyways, Bill Clinton starts running across the street. It's, it's like really dangerous, and it's too late for the Secret Service to go with them. And this bus driver, who probably to this day doesn't know this, sped up and came within an inch of hitting Bill Clinton on a road in Washington. Now, don't anyone say praise the Lord on that one. I mean, that would have been, you know, a, a, a tragedy, but, but he barely makes it, you know, and I... But, but typically, uh, wealthy men don't run, right? They just walk. And, and if, you know, they got to slow down traffic, they just walk. Well, Zacchaeus runs. Zacchaeus jumps up in front of a tree. And what Zacchaeus doesn't understand, and this is what's so cool about having this story, is Zacchaeus thinks he's just going to get a glimpse of Jesus. He doesn't know he's on Jesus' calendar. He, he doesn't even know that he's on a divine calendar, that, that in Jesus' appointment book coming through Jericho, this day that Zacchaeus is on that calendar, that he has got an appointment scheduled with him. And so he wants to see Jesus. He just doesn't know that Jesus wants to see him. (laughs) He's about to find out uh, as we get into verse five. He's got this divine appointment on the calendar. Verses five through seven reads this. And when Jesus came to the place, this is the place of the tree, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and he came down. And received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Now it's interesting because as we look at this event, notice that Jesus sees everything. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd before. Um, It's a little, it's a little discombobulating. And sometimes you don't, you don't really know what's going on. I, I tell you, every time we we get our bags in the Liberian airport, uh, it, it's. Uh, it's a zoo. It's just an absolute zoo. People are, are cut in front of you, swinging, you know, you're, you're ducking punches meant for somebody else that jumped in front of you. It's just, just a zoo in a lot of ways. Sometimes crowds can be discombobulated. Not, not for Jesus. He's completely surrounded. He sees everything. He looks up. He sees Zacchaeus. Notice also that Jesus knows everything. You know, Jesus may have been through Jericho a couple of times, may have known it, but he calls Zacchaeus by name. Just, just amazing, this, this personal uh, touch that Jesus has. And then finally, we see that he is very personal. He's coming to his house. He wants to sit down. He wants to enjoy a meal with him. He wants to fellowship with Zacchaeus. And it just shows us, it just gives us a glimpse into the heart of Jesus Christ. Very busy man, interested in individuals. You know, and I, I think just by way of application, and we're kind of, I don't want to get too far from the text, but by way of application, you know, God is not so busy that he doesn't care. <laughs> about even what's going on in your life today. Many of us come in this room, we've got cares, we've got burdens. I mean, join the club. We, we do too, I do too. And um, we've got a God who cares. We've got a, a savior who cares. And so just as an encouragement, we see this really uh, borne out in the life here in this interaction of Zacchaeus. By the way, it's also somebody that society doesn't care about. It's somebody that society actually hates. Jesus actually cares about this man, there's a personal touch there. How does Zacchaeus respond? He loves it. Ah, let's go. Before, before you withdraw your invitation, I'm, I'm sure Zacchaeus is like, well, surely Jesus knows a lot, but maybe he doesn't know about me, so I better, I'm gonna get home and get this ready before he withdraws his invitation to my house. So he, he makes haste, he receives him joyfully, but guess what? There was another response that day. Nobody else was very happy about it. In fact, notice that it says they 
that some of them complained. They all complained. They all complained. They're very upset. We learn a little bit more about this word, this phrase. It means to murmur greatly or to complain continually. And not only that, as Luke is describing the events here, he adds a Greek preposition on the front of that verb to to make it even more emphatic. They were really griping. They really had heartburn, if you will, over the fact that Jesus was going to this man's house. And, you know, going to Zacchaeus' house, and this is why the heartburn was there, was, was akin to Jesus sharing in this man's sins. This is, this is how the culture would have viewed it. They'd say, Jesus is a great rabbi. Jesus is a man of God, or Jesus at least teaches the scriptures. Why would he go to a house of this, you know, grade five level sinner? <laughs> Why would he even share in this man's sins? And, you know, it brings me back to where I started the message, which is, wait a minute, does God like good people or bad people? You know, it's so interesting because when you talk about people going to heaven, it's always about, well, you got to be good to go to heaven. And yet we see in the life of Christ the pursuit of people who were not good enough to go to heaven. In fact, they were societal outcasts of the day. In fact, if, if you took a straw poll on who's the most spiritual guy in Jericho, Zacchaeus might have been on the very bottom of that list on the very bottom, not just close to the bottom, but on the very bottom of that list. And this is why you see there's this consistency in religious thought. And this is it. Good people go to heaven. Now, what do you have to do to be good? That's where all the religions and denominations kind of start getting their own little specific little laundry list. And that's where the disagreements come. But at the hardcore issue, this is what religion believes. This is why I believe that religion, we could call it very short-sighted. It's very misinformed. In fact, they would say that heaven is simply a reward for the righteous. We would say that heaven's a gift for the guilty. It's the exact opposite. And we'll talk about that. And, and, And the question becomes this morning, does the Bible agree with this? Does the Bible agree that you have to be good to go to heaven? See, that's the common thought uh, in our day. That's the common thought around the world. And you know what's so interesting about that is the Bible doesn't teach that you need to be good to go to heaven. In fact, it's much worse than that. In fact, Matthew 5.48 says it this way, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. See, so it's not goodness that we're after. Goodness will condemn you to hell. Goodness will never make you acceptable to God, perfection will. Now, that shouldn't make you any more comforted. That should actually be, you know, be lighting a fire in your seat right now. Like, ooh, that does not feel comfortable, and it shouldn't feel comfortable. But this is the truth of the Word of God. This is, this is God's standard. And then notice that phrase that I've got underlined there too, just as. See, it's not, you're not comparing yourself to your neighbor. Who gives a rip how much better you are than your neighbor? Well, my neighbor doesn't blow his leaves and I mow my lawn and I had to. I'm not going to get you anywhere in eternity. See, we have to be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. And how perfect is God? That's kind of a redundant, dumb question. Perfection means you've never made a mistake. You've never done anything wrong. You're completely perfect and holy and pure. That's the standard. See, it's not good. <laughs> That's... Th- That's the short-sightedness of religion, as if somehow we're going to achieve some level of goodness that's going to impress a perfect God. No, to be with a perfect God, you and I must possess a perfection that's equal to his. And so it sets the stage, really, for the gospel. 1 Peter 1.16 says, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And see, that's one of the things that we need to understand. Based on this standard, who could qualify? Nobody. (laughs) Nobody. That's the honest answer. Nobody could qualify based on this standard. In fact, we would all, if you any football, well, football is overseas soccer players in here. The red card, man, you lack righteousness. We all lack righteousness. That's the deal. In fact, if we were to stand here, we would understand that no one would qualify because no one is perfect. And not to drive the point home any further, but let's drive the point home any fur- a little bit further you know, we don't have to even go through the entire Ten Commandments to realize this. You know, how many lies have you told in your lifetime? 
The answer generally, universally to that question is too many to count. For all of us, not, I mean, even pastors. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, too many lies. So you, you lack perfection. But let's go forward. Have you ever stolen anything? You ever taken something that didn't belong to you? Okay, again, yeah, I mean, and I know everyone took a cookie when they were three, but they've never stolen anything since. I, I get it, yeah, I'm, that was me too. Just kidding, right? So yeah, I mean, but, but we lack perfection. Uh, Jesus goes on to say that if you look at somebody with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you hate somebody, you're angry with somebody without cause, you've committed murder. I mean, we got problems. We got lots of problems. We're not perfect. But uh, as they say, the problem gets worse. This is not a, a good infomercial, but the problem does get worse. And, and it's so amazing <laughs> because isn't it funny? Like when, like when I first heard this message, when someone was sharing this with me for the first time, you know what comforted me? The, the thought that, well, yeah, I'm not perfect, but no one else is either. I don't understand that thinking now. It made sense to me then. It kind of made me feel better about myself then. But imagine telling somebody like, I'm in the ICU and I'm getting ready to die, but you know what? I'm not as bad as the guy in the room next to me. And like taking comfort in that. No, you're still in the ICU. <laughs> we still have a serious problem. And in this way, we kind of justify ourselves, but the scriptures are very clear that this standard is gonna be the standard by which we're judged, this standard of perfection Acts 17, 30 through 31 says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent or to change their mind because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, how? By the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And see that judgment that is coming, that judgment that is based on a righteous standard is clearly spelled out in scripture as well. In fact, the, the Bible says it's a judgment that we deserve. Romans 6, 23a says the wages of sin is death. Now, what's crazy about this is it, it's, it, that's an interesting verse because I can, you can almost quote that universally almost anywhere in the world that has a Christian background, and people can finish that phrase for you. For the wages of sin is death. And everyone knows that. It's crazy. Like, been to Liberia, Sierra Leone, in, in lots of places, they can finish that sentence. Anyone that's got a Christian worldview. World What's really interesting is how religion is short-sighted and it glosses over this. It glosses over this truth that judgment awaits because you'll notice that none of the good works take care of the death penalty. They're just stacked on top of sin. And so even if you've done the crime, they act like even if you've done the crime, as long as you try to do good going forward, uh, then, then somehow you'll, es you'll escape the penalty that you've earned. And just, just think about that. How would that work in a, in a human court system? Judge, I murdered somebody yesterday, but from this day forward, I promise not to do that anymore. Okay, well, we won't punish you for that crime. No, that would never work because past sins have to be punished. Past sins require a consequence. It doesn't matter how good you're going to be. And to kind of illustrate that a little bit more, just to pull up an illustration, if you were in the hot Georgia sun and I were to offer you a, a half full bottle of cold water, and let's just, let's say you're germ oriented, but I assure you, I didn't put my lips on it. Nobody's touched it with their lips. Just half full. It's mountain water, spring water, Ozarka, whatever you drink, pure Kroger purified drinking water, whatever, <laughs> whatever you drink. It's pure, it's good, it's clean water. You're in the hot sun, you would take that drink, okay? But what if I said, hold on a second, let me, let me grab a, cup, a, a couple handfuls of dirt, let me throw that in there. And then I said, let me just drop just one drop of poison in there. That's all I wanna do. And let me shake it up for you. Now would you drink that drink? I mean, clearly, we, I know we got some young men in here. I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof, I would drink it. No, we wouldn't drink that drink because it, it's poisonous, it's dirty. And I said, okay, no, I get that. But wait, wait, wait. Let me fill the rest of it up with clean water. Let me just, let me fill it to the top now with clean water. Now will you drink it? And the answer would still be no. Because that water would never be good enough. That water would never be pure. That water would never be perfect. And see, this is why trying to be good in the area of, uh, of spirituality is never good enough. This is why it's never going to be acceptable. We need something to clean the container, so to speak, and we can't do it no matter how much good 
that we do. See, no, try, no amount of being good erases the lack of perfection in the past. And that's our problem. We lack righteousness. We deserve punishment. And quite frankly, there's nothing we can do to weasel our way out of that that sure fate for each one of us. This is, by the way, explains why God pursues sinners. Kind of coming back full circle and coming back to the Zacchaeus story. And this is why in verse 10 of Luke 19, we have such good news. It's it's news that we know, but but in perspective, it becomes even greater. And that is this, save your save. That's the ultimate solution. And notice in verse 10, it's, it reads this, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And you know, the Bible calls Jesus Christ a savior. And you know what that implies for you and me? We need saving. It, it, if you don't realize anything other than today is you're not gonna get to heaven by trying harder. You need a savior. That's why God sent a savior, by the way. He knew this. Nothing takes God by surprise. In fact, he calls us lost. And you know, the Bible doesn't tell lost men and women to try to be good enough to be found. The Bible doesn't tell lost men and women to find themselves. That's not what the Bible tells. The Bible tells lost men and women, God has sent a rescuer. God is on a rescue mission. Will you trust in his deliverance? And that is the message of the gospel. This is exactly what we see here in verse 10, the, the very fact that God thinks you need a savior. Let me, uh, let me just jump out. They used to tell us, I used to be in sales. They used to tell us in sales, if someone offers you a stick of gum, always take it. Because what are they telling you? Your breath stinks, right? So you, you take it. You, you assume by the very fact that they're offering you something that you actually need it. And I think we need to bring the same mindset to the Bible. If God sent a savior, you and I need to be convinced that we need it. You, you don't send a lifeguard to save people who are swimming. You send a lifeguard to save people who are drowning. And oftentimes, spiritually speaking, people don't know they're drowning. They're making every effort they can to get to the side of the pool, so to speak. God's saying, you're drowning. You're, you're not just like taking a couple of breaths above water. You're literally under, sucking in water. You need a savior. God has sent a rescue mission. So it's not about you trying. That's what religion promotes. It's about you trusting in God's solution. And so we see that the Bible says that a savior has been sent. Jesus died for your sins. He paid the penalty you deserve. And God the Father accepts his payment on your behalf, period. That's the good news of the gospel. So you don't have to face that penalty because a savior faced it for you. Now, how do we know that God accepted his sacrifice? That's always a great question. I think if we're being like uh, good students, we should ask that question. If we're banking our eternal destiny on what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, how do we know for sure that we can trust what he did for us? This is the beautiful thing about the resurrection. God did something miraculous that's never been repeated in history to raise a man from the dead never to die again. And this is what he says. We've already quoted this verse, but look at the last phrase now. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent or to change their mind because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. See, this is one of the reasons as we celebrate the resurrection day, this is one of the primary reasons that God raised Jesus from the dead. That as you look back on what he did for you on the cross, you can say, I believe, I trust in what he did because God accepted his death in my place. I deserve death. The wages of sin is death. My savior died for me. He paid that penalty that I deserve. And by the way, when Jesus died for your sins, how many of your sins did he die for? That's right, all of them. Past, present, and future. And then when Jesus was getting ready, when he breathed his last breath, he screams from the cross. One word in the Greek, it's tetelestai. It's translated, it is finished. It could have been translated paid in full. He wants you to know that when he died on the cross for your sins, he paid that bill in full. And if he paid it in full, what's left for you to pay? Exactly nothing. By the way, if you want a bracelet with that word on it, there's some out in the foyer too. Take them, take them. Because if if all you did the next week was look at that bracelet and said, praise God, as Josh and the worship team led, hallelujah. (laughs) 
All I got is a hallelujah? Well, man, sing it. Sing it, guys. Because it's finished. It's paid in full. And guess what? God, to Jesus, is paid in full, said amen by raising him from the dead three days later. He said, you're right. My dearly beloved son, you did pay it in full. And I'm going to prove it to the world by raising you from the dead. And this is the beauty about the resurrection. Now, those of you that are astute, let's go back to Zacchaeus' story because you saw that I skipped some verses. And that always makes you feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> me, me too. But I did that for a reason. All right, verse eight. Yeah, but what about this? What about Zacchaeus? Look, at, look how Zacchaeus rolls when he gets Jesus in his home. He says, then Zacchaeus stood and said, Lord, look, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Wow, pretty impressive. Those are some really good things that he's doing there. Verse nine, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Now, did Zacchaeus do a bunch of good things? Yeah, I mean, incredible things, actually. <laughs> he's, he, he gives half of his goods to the poor. I mean, go, go, imagine if you respond that way, you just go clear out half your bank account today and give it to the poor. That's pretty impressive. And then if you ever cheated anybody in life, you're going to go back and pay four times as much. It's not like, you know, when I was a kid, I've, and I have done this a couple of times, I went back into a store where I'd stole a Snickers bar or something when I was little, and I wanted to pay for it as an adult. They don't even know what to do with that. Like, I, they, like they don't even know how to enter that in in their system. You know, it kind of confuses things. But imagine taking everything that you've extorted from someone and paying four times as much. This is what Zacchaeus is willing to do. But it, what's interesting about it is the way Jesus responds. He doesn't say, wow, because you've done these things, now you're a son of Abraham. Notice what he says, and we'll look, let's look at how he, what he didn't say. Jesus didn't say salvation has come because Zacchaeus is now a good person. Was, was Zacchaeus a good person? No, he was I mean, by God's standard, he wasn't. Notice Jesus does not say salvation has come because Zacchaeus has given all his money away to the poor. He doesn't say salvation has come because Zacchaeus is now doing good works. In fact, I love it because verse 9 actually uses the word because. We know exactly why salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house that day. It's a little confusing, though. We want to look at it. He says, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Now, as we've been following along the story, that should strike you as odd because he was already a son of Abraham. He was a son of Abraham before Jesus came to Jericho physically. He was a Jew. He was a son of Abraham when Jesus stepped into his door before he even ate a bite. He was a son of Abraham before he said that he was going to do all these amazing things. What is Jesus talking about here? He says, today, salvation has come to this house. Why? Because he also is a son of Abraham. And in order to understand what Jesus is saying here, we've got to go to Galatians, which I think clearly describes what he's talking about. Galatians 3, 6 through 7 says, just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. To become a true son of Abraham with God's righteousness credited to your account, God's perfection credited to your account, which is what we need to go to heaven, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Abraham is with God. That's how anybody ever spends eternity with God. It's God providing for us what we could not provide for ourselves. And so where does that leave us? Well, if you come to God and you want to talk about the good life that you've lived, God doesn't save good people. He saves sinners. If you want to come to God and talk about how you've been baptized or circumcised or catechized, God doesn't save people who do that. He saves sinners who simply trust in him. If you want to talk about how you've kept the commandments or you observed the sacraments or how you've been to church this many times, God doesn't save people who do that. He saves sinners who simply trust in him. And this is why the apostle Paul says this in 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. See, he doesn't come to save good people because there's no, there's good people don't exist. (laughs) By definition, they they don't exist according to the word of God. So God has sent a rescue mission to save sinners. Notice he goes on, verse 16. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus might show all longsuffering 
as a pattern to those who are going to do what? Believe on him for everlasting life. If Jesus has completed the work, there's nothing left to be do, uh, left to be done in order to obtain eternal life. We simply trust in the Savior. We simply believe that God's rescue mission uh, is enough. By the way, as you as you, as we think through this, you know, paralyzed people don't try to walk. They trust in a stretcher. Drowning people don't try to swim. They trust in a lifeguard. People who are skydiving don't trust in themselves to fly. They trust in a parachute, right? We can see the illustration. Sinful man, sinful woman, sinful child does not try to get to heaven on their good works. They trust in God's rescue mission. They trust in God's rescuer. And, you know, it just reminds me uh, this morning, you know, Josh uh, and the worship team did a good job of just really emphasizing the finished work of Christ. And so we've got his death uh, on the cross represented in this picture, but we also have the empty tomb representing this picture. This is the completed work of Jesus Christ, uh, the convincing proof that God the Father accepts what he did for you and I. And so I would just say this this morning, as we look at the work of Christ 2,000 years ago, as it relates to each of our salvation, everyone in this room and everyone may be listening online, as we look at your own individual salvation, I want you to, I want you to see and I want you to be convinced that as we look at the cross work of Jesus Christ in that empty tomb, I want you to be convinced that God the Father is completely satisfied with what Jesus did for you. I, I just want you to be convinced from that, from the scriptures. And I think if we had more time, we could bear that out uh, even further. The question this morning for each one of you is, is are you? And, and, and I'm not saying, do you like Jesus? That's a real, I mean, <laughs> most people do, Right? I'm not saying, do you like Jesus? Are you convinced he's your only way to heaven? Are you convinced that this is God's rescue, that he is God's rescue mission? Are you convinced that what he did for you is enough, that there's nothing else required of you but to simply trust in the one who died for you and rose again? Are you convinced this morning? And if you're not or you're, you're hesitating a little bit and you still think you might need to do a little bit more, I just want to encourage you, stop trying Trust in God's solution. God raised him from the dead. That's designed to be convincing proof that what he did for you is enough. And let's close there uh, with a word of prayer. Lord, I do thank you um, for your finished work. I just rejoice to know that um, it, even as I look at my own life and the, the, the many failures um, in my own personal life, I just rejoice to know that I've got a Savior that I I'm not being left in the, in the deep end of the pool uh, to save myself or to not left out in the lost in a forest to find myself, but that you sent a rescue mission for me, that his name is Jesus, that he did everything needed for me to spend eternity with you in heaven, including paying the penalty that I deserved and then providing a righteousness equal to yours simply when I believe in him. And so, Lord, as we go about uh, the rest of our day, may you just give us a spring in our step and an eye uh, to heaven. May we, may we cry out with uh, gratitude uh, and hallelujah for what you accomplished for each one of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.